lot of pressure, uh, lots of comments, and a lot of messages that the Oxford vaccine discussion was not as uh, thorough, if you will. And similarly, there were some news that were about Moderna as well, which were not that interesting. So I thought that this is an important uh, task to for us to stay up to date about the Oxford and the Moderna and other vaccines that are happening. So I wanted to do a retake on that and look at the data itself by us. We together actually look at the data. Previously, when I was reporting on the Oxford vaccine and Moderna, I was looking at what some of the articles were saying. And I wanted to do what I do for the other things, and that is go into the studies, go into the data, and look at it together. So um, hello, Jim, from Iowa. Uh, welcome. Uh, Eid Mubarak, back to you, Imran. Um, good morning from Australia. Good morning, Chantel. Thank you very much. So, so guys, uh, the important thing today is that uh, I have been looking at a lot of turn, a lot of uh, discussion in Moderna, Oxford, and other vaccines. And it seems like there are there's a lot of confusion as well. And so I wanted to make sure that we do a retake on these vaccines as well. I know that I had promised that I'll do CoQ10 today. So if you guys don't mind, please let me do that on Monday or Tuesday. Monday I will be off. Let me do that on Tuesday. That would give me more time to prepare as well. And let us look at some of the things today that I think are very, very important and are important for the for the for this time. So there are three main topics that I want to discuss. Number one, I want I want to discuss the um, vaccines. Number two, I want to discuss the CDC's uh, um, um, recommendation that. Okay, there once more. And thirdly, I wanted to look at various tests. Many people have been asking me that, what is the sensitivity or specificity of a test? And so how accurate can a test be? So we will talk about that. So JR, you're saying that no vaccine will work. I do not know what is the basis of your me method. If you have a link or a study or some scientific reason to say that, please share that. Okay, so let's start a discussion. Um, So the we will talk about that, Manu, separately. Um, OK, so today's topic is dis, uh, set. Let's start our discussion. Really, really important. And we'll start from here. So this is the stat. This is actually a medical news kind of a site. So this is still a news, but I want to go over the data that is available. So this is Moderna. And look at the date here. May 18. That is when the whole world became very excited that Moderna had reported. So this was a Moderna's reporting that there were out of 45 people, eight people had shown the uh, antibodies, neutralizing antibodies. So here, this is what came in. First and most important thing, and that is what people are protesting even now, including me, and that is that Moderna has offered no data for their uh, for their publication, the statements that they released. What they had sa said was, and this is their statement, there is no data available. Um, so there is a question, Kristen says that, have you heard of San Diego company that has antibody that clears virus from body in four days? Kristen, uh, Christina, I have not, please send me the link. But this is uh, Oregon here, 008, uh, welcome. This is what is happening. There are hundreds of companies that are saying that virus can be cleared and I think in case of Moderna, for example, we were all kind of led by them through their uh, marketing statements. And when they are asked that where is the data, they said, we will publish that. It is a similar thing that I talked about the Ivermectin yesterday and the doctors from Bangladesh are saying that they would publish it. So this kind of a thing, the vaccine, which claims a company that claims that a vaccine is actually working should offer the data. So here, look at this. What they said was, so this is company statement. There's no data here yet. What they said was that we tried 25 milligram dose, or sorry, microgram dose and 100 and 250. So there were multiple doses and that is uh, normal for phase one and two that the dose uh, limits are tested. 
what is the smallest dose that can be given what is the uh, largest dose that can be given and still be safe and what what are the safety measures so there is nothing bad about testing in these doses then the company said that out of 24 out of every one that was given 25 microgram four people developed neutralizing antibodies the question is who else got it and what was their status similarly they also said that out of 100 microgram four people out of them also developed neutralizing antibodies but once again the question is how many people actually received it what was their profile did they have comorbidities were they healthy normally in phase one there are healthy individuals you don't take people with comorbidities but anyways what is a profile we do not know and then what were their age range and then what happened if they were let's say 10 what happened to six so there is no data for that as well now how about 250 what happened there so moderna's first bigger issue here um, so christina would look into that moderna's first bigger issue here is that number one they have released no data they have never released any data so that's the way i think that company uh, works and they had 45 participants their age range of the participants were from age 18 to 55. They said that eight people had developed neutralizing antibodies. However, they did not give us a profile of them. I saw some people criticizing, and I'm going to give you a balanced opinion here. It's not that uh, I'm criticizing Moderna or I am saying that they are the best. I'm just looking at it. For example, I do not like that they do not have any data. So how can we really look into it? And on the flip side, I'm going to look at a study published by Oxford and kind of look at their professionalism better than Moderna. So after two weeks of the second dose, they developed the neutralizing antibodies. And I see many people kind of uh, uh, criticizing that why two weeks after. So I actually do not have a criticism there because here is the explanation. What happens is, and we've been doing this discussion many, many times. What happens is that let's say here is a macrophage that macrophage picks up the pathogen, let's say coronavirus. Remember, this is the innate arm. And so this is the innate arm that is immediately responsive. And then this macrophage would bring this pathogen to the acquired arm. And acquired arm will then have a T naive cell sitting here who doesn't know the purpose of his life. And then his eye, eye looks a little weird as well. But oh well, he's OK. <laughs> he's all right. He's a naive cell. <laughs> so the naive cell is here. And then that cell would become either helper 1 or helper 2. So helper 1 here, and this is helper 2, correct? And then the helper 1 will move towards cytotoxic T cell, cytotoxic T cells, and this will cause the B cell activation, correct? We have, we have discussed this many, many times. The important thing is that this system takes time to gear up anywhere from seven days to 10 days. So meaning it is not that today you give somebody a vaccine. So let's say instead of the pathogen here, you have actually injected a vaccine. And let's say that is a spike protein of the pathogen. When that spike protein is going to be picked up by the macrophage, our immune system still needs the same behavior. It still needs the same kind of a time to respond. So that means it is not necessary that today you give somebody a vaccine and tomorrow they're fine or today they're fine. No, today when you give them the vaccine, it would take one or one week, or seven days or more for them to have their B cell become active. So now if we look at this, this line, in this context, then what I do not know is that when was the second dose given? Was it the today is the first dose and this evening is the second dose? Or today is the first dose and five days later is the second dose? So really two weeks after will have to be actually seen from when the doses were. So let's say if the dose started 
first dose was today that is the first dose then five days later was the second dose and then after that there was another let's say two weeks 14 days then a total time of 19 days was spent before the vaccine developed enough antibodies we don't know so without knowing the distance between the, the dose, first dose and second dose, we don't really know what is going on. But if, let's say, if we assume for our own uh, purposes, if we assume that, all right, the first and second dose or whatever, maybe second dose was higher and the second dose was given today and after the second dose, uh, we had two weeks, it still does not look too bad. But if the first dose was, let's say, one week earlier, just one thank you very much, Eid Mubarak to you as well. So if the first dose was one week early, then the second dose was now, a week later, and then the uh, the antibodies are developing in another 14 days, then it is three weeks. So um, usually our immune system doesn't behave that way. Our immune system behaves faster. So I'm not too much hung up on two week. It's okay. Immune system takes time. Now, profile of the people that develop the antibodies that profile is not given. They have said, Moderna has said, that there are two types of antibodies that have been developed. They said everyone developed a binding antibody. A binding antibody simply means that an antibody that is against some part of the virus. That is fine. Uh, binding antibodies usually do not neutralize. That is, remember I gave an example in the past that maybe there is an antibody stuck to my head. And it is not doing anything. It's just sitting there like a cap. And I can do my function all the day long with, with that antibody sitting on my head. On the other hand, if there is an antibody that comes and binds my arms or my hands, now I cannot function. So that antibody is neutralizing my function or my activity. So binding antibodies, everybody developed, doesn't matter too much. Eight of them developed neutralizing antibodies. Good. That is a good thing. The question is what happened to the rest and the people who developed these, what was their profile? Then another important thing is amount of antibody. Did they develop sufficient quantity of antibody that when the actual virus will arrive, we'll have enough memory cells and enough antibodies to attack it? I hope it does. I mean, again, at the end of the day, there are scientists who are working there, but company has not... Uh, disclosed that and look please remember when a vaccine is given there are two things that would happen with the vaccine when a vaccine is given there are two outcomes number one antibodies are formed immediately and by immediately as you can tell seven to ten days two weeks fine so antibodies are formed so if during that time the virus comes into our body that these pre-formed antibodies that are circulating will attack it so that is good. On the other hand, it would also create memory cells. And memory cells is even more important because if the virus now invades after a month, then the antibodies, these guys have gone. Memory cells are present. And as soon as they would detect that the virus is in, they would start making new fresh antibodies. And that happens within a day or two. So it's a fast process. It can take care of the um, the virus. So the point of vaccination is not to have antibodies generated. The point of vaccination is also to have B cell created or the memory cells created, B or T cells, which would attack when the virus comes in a month later or two months later or a year later, depending upon how long those uh, memory cells can live. So Sandra says, good morning, Dr. Mubeen. Thanks for all the info. I am learning a lot, even though I am a regular kids teacher. Sandra, you are very welcome. And I believe at this time, there is no difference between a doctor and a lay person and others. We all need to be educated on these things so we can take care of ourselves, our loved ones. Plus, I think that there is a global opportunity for all of us to kind of unite in this way and become more sensitive towards our health and how to take care of these things. So I am very, very glad that you are here. And I think we all should learn more. And I do that with you as well. Okay, so back here. The 
profile is not known not good amount of antibody produced is not known not good but i would suspect that if it is immune system that is reacting immune system would take care of the correct amount of the antibodies that are needed and if there are proper uh, memory cells they should be there too so not too worried but data is not available then what happened to the rest of the people i've said that multiple times so out of 45 eight developed neutralizing what happened to the rest then what is the response durability this is some i, I read that somewhere and i actually once again do not feel too bad about it here is why response durability means how long the response can stay or how long can we have the confidence that if the virus comes into our body our body will respond after the antigen has trained it the point is that we don't have the virus for such a long time to be able to see how our immune system responds and how long does it respond so saying to a vaccination company may that be oxford or may that be moderna or sinovac or somebody else to say that guarantee us that if you are giving a vaccine that vaccine is going to work for two years or going to keep the person safe for two years that's not possible we just don't know the dynamics of this virus yet i can tell you this that in the past i have shown the studies in my past uh, talks that for sars cov that is sars cov 1 the memory cells once created stayed in for 3 years so the person developed so this is the natural immunity by the memory cells for the infected patients that the person developed 3 years immunity so if there is any similarity and the immune system of our gets triggered and is then the memory cells are formed in a similar way as sars cov 1 then we can actually see that this durability may be for months to years which is excellent which is fine but asking a vaccine company at this time to tell us the duration of their vaccines uh, viability or or the safety of our body they cannot do it so it's not a good question to ask them thank you very much sandra thank you for the eid wishes there is a question uh, some people think for repeated bouts of sepsis the memory cells are the cause and need to find a way to erase them no i don't think so memory cells don't do these kind of things that there are bouts of sepsis look let me quickly explain how a memory cell work so i hope everybody heard the question the question is that it is possible that the memory cells are causing repeated bouts of sepsis or re repetition of infection so look here is a or repetition of the inflammatory response so imagine that we have a stack of we have a shelf and this shelf is lymph node in this lymph node there are millions of memory cells present here for many kind of infections that we have or pathogens that we had they just sitting in there they're sleeping all of them have one of their hand sticking out so that is a receptor so they have a hand sticking out which can allow them to connect with one specific kind of an antibody not antibody antigen and which antigen whatever antigen they are they were formed for now this these b cells or t cells the memory cells they are sleeping in there they are in a low activity state they have their receptors receptors you know sticking out and they're just waiting for a virus or or their appropriate pathogen to come and connect with them so let's say for the time being this this b cell with this receptor is for coronavirus and it it was formed when somebody became infected with the sars cov 2 and now the the b cell is sitting in the shelf sleeping there for any future interaction this b cell will only proliferate proliferate means divide in numbers and become an army from one cell and become activated meaning giving antibodies will only happen when a coronavirus comes in and attaches here 
if the virus does not come and attaches to this B cell that is sleeping here, then this B cell is not going to become activated. It is not going to make any antibodies and then there, will, there is going to be nothing, number one. Number two, the idea of sepsis is repeated infection. A B cell is killing the virus, not causing the infection. So uh, the question that you had asked, Embol, uh, but the over response, Okay, so Embol is saying that instead of the infection, you're saying inflammatory response. So again, for that, there needs to be a virus here that would connect with the B cell. The memory B cell is not really active. It is sitting dormant, waiting to be stimulated. When it has the right anti antigen connected with it, then it would very quickly respond. It already knows how to respond. Its receptor already recognizes the virus, but that is about it. This B cell has nothing else special to it. Susan, you're very welcome. So does this uh, make sense, Ambal, that having B cells is not a reason for inflammatory responses? So going back here, so the question of response durability, I don't think it's a valid question. So not shouldn't be asked. And no vaccine in the market. So this is another thing about Moderna that they still do not have a drug out in the market. They have many drugs in the pipeline, but they have nothing out in the market. That means, do they have a successful product from the past? We do not know. So that is the problem. So I think... I'll tell you my unpleasant feeling with Moderna is that they have released no data. There is no study to look at. So that is like the scientific community or the people who can understand these things, they are kept blindsided. And the only news or only knowledge out there is what they have fed the marketing or the, or the news outlets. So that is the kind of discomfort with Moderna at this time. Now, continuing on, I also want to talk about Ox Oxford too. But before I go to Oxford, I want to show you this. Look at this. There is another uh, Chinese company. So we've been talking about Sinovac as well. So this is another Chinese, Chinese company called CanSino Biologics. And I wanted to show you how they presented their studies. Uh, so look at this. This is a study. So CanSino, uh, I'm showing you the example of a good way of coming into the market. So number one, they have a trial going on. So look here, phase one clinical trial of COVID-19 vaccine in 18 to 60 healthy adults. Sponsor CanSino, here is what they would do. Here is when it will start. Here is when it would finish. So they have a trial. They will have to report all the data for that trial. So that is a good thing to do. Similarly, they have already done a trial and they came back with the data. This is what you would have expected from Moderna, for example, to come, come back and say, hey, guys, we had 45 people. Out of them, eight have gotten this, three became uh, ill, and the illness means this, and here is the data. So look at CanSino as an example of a company that comes in with data. Check this out. And please, uh, it's not that I favor Chinese companies over U.S. company or, or U.K. companies. Some people have been asking me that. It's nothing like that. I just am looking at these things together. We are learning together. And I'm just trying to look at things to say, okay, th these guys did a good job. I understand what they did. They gave me the data to look at. Here is a company that says, even after requesting that, can you give us data? They say, well, we'll publish that in the future. So um, the I am just talking about that because at this time with Moderna, for example, all the medical community can do is nothing but look at their news outlet messages and repeat them. And it seems like we all are taken for a ride as well because there is a lack of data for the remaining people and the profiles of the patients and so on. So that is the discomfort there. Anyways, look at this one. This is CanSino's study. So they said we had people 18 to 60 years age range. Then they said we created, a, we created groups from them. 
We offered them intramuscular injection. The primary outcome was adverse event in the seven days post vaccination. So there was one adverse event within the seven days of giving a vaccine. And now you must be thinking, what is what is an adverse event? And they would define that right here. So just like that, if Moderna would say that three people became sick, they should say it. I know that they said they developed fever and some other things, but that data should be out here. The safety was assessed over 28 day post vaccination. So good. So now we know that, all right, for 28 days, we they kept observing the patients for safety. Then they say neutralizing antibody response induced by vaccination were detected in SARS, with SARS-CoV-2 virus neutralization. T cell response were assessed with enzyme linked amino assay. So after doing this, look at the data. At least one adverse reaction within the first seven days after the vaccination was reported in 30, 30, 83% participants in the low dose group, 30, 83% in the middle, go, do, uh, middle dose group, and then 27 or 75% in the high dose group. And so now you will be thinking, okay, what is that adverse reaction? And that is the most common injection site adverse reaction was pain. So almost 70 to 83% people said, I have pain at the site of injection. Okay, fine. Now we know what that adverse reaction was. We can think about it that, do I want to have that pain or not? Then, which was reported in 58% of the cases. Then look at this. Other adverse reactions, severe reactions, fever, 50%, fatigue, 47, 44%, headache, 39%, muscle pain, 17%, fever, 46%. These are adverse reactions. They came out and they said, this is what people felt. So now you can decide, do you want fever from that or not? There's 46% chance of you developing fever. That is how data should be given. And they have all the tables available. Then they are telling us here that ELISA antibodies and neutralizing antibodies increase significantly at day 14, which is fine. I would expect that that would happen because immune system starts gearing up in seven to 10 days. So that's fine. 14 days is not bad and peaked 28 days post vaccination. Now the question here that is not answered is, did they go away? Did these vaccines go away? And I do not think that they have actually challenged these folks with the infection to say what would happen. It is too dangerous to do it at this time. So that's why they probably cannot provide us that data which Oxford has done for monkeys to say, we then challenge them with the virus. So we'll go there in a second. What I'm doing at this time is kind of looking at the parameters that provide us comfort and knowledge to understand if a vaccine is useful or not useful. You, you should look at all vaccine in a similar way that what did the company do? What were the participants? What were their age ranges? What were the comorbidities? What kind of antibodies did they develop? When did they develop them? What was the amount of antibody? Did they challenge them again with the virus or the same something, that, especially in the monkeys, not in humans? And what happened there? What is the price of the vaccine? What is the capability of a company to make those vaccines if needed on, on mass and so on? So uh, then they're talking about tolerable and immunogenic at 28 days post vaccination. This is very interesting that they're saying the 85 covered vectored COVID-19 vaccine is tolerable and immunogenic at 20 day, 28 days. So from their data now, they're saying that at least we know for 28 days you're fine and you will be tolerable uh, and the vaccine is fine. Good, we have data. You don't like 28 days, fine. They will still have to provide us more data, but at least we have the data. Humoral responses against SARS-CoV-2. Humoral response means B cell response, 28 days. T cell response, cytotoxic response or helper T cell response, 14 days. Good. Lots of data is given here. Like it. And then if you go down, they have the introduction and they have their data and they have their tables available and you can look at that and you can assess it by yourself. So this is an example of a good study. Now let's look at um, so this is CanSino. Now let's look at Oxford as well, once more in the same context. And what happened was many people had said to me that, hey, you are not being fair to Oxford. They actually have a vaccine that is working and they just, the Forbes did a wrong thing that they casted this 
doubt over them. And I wanted to then go in and look at the data by myself. So here is where, luckily for us, Oxford also have a study available. Moderna is the only one that is in the news and is uh, they went from $6 billion to $30 billion company within the last few months, but they do not have the data available. So look at this. This is Oxford's data. And what they're saying here is, I think I've highlighted some of the things. Um, <laughs> here. So this is the discussion. So we all know that what they had done, what they did was they had injected uh, monkeys. They had vaccinated monkeys, macaques, rhesus macaques. And then once they had vaccinated them, then they challenged them with high doses of the virus. And then they were able to say that the virus was not able to produce lower respiratory tract infections or pneumonia, which is, I would consider that to be a great thing. My fear when I become infected by COVID-19 will be, will I end up on a ventilator? And if I do not develop lower respiratory tract um, infection, then my chances of being on a ventilator are low or, or zero. And the monkey developed upper respiratory tract infection, which is fine. So I wanted to show us, I wanted to go over this by myself and also show this to the community here as well. So here they're saying that in their discussion, look, the very important thing. Um, Ahmed, uh, Dr. Ahmed Zafran, thank you very much. Eid Mubarak to you as well. So look at this. Here we showed that a single vaccination with this vaccine, CHADOX1 and COVID-19 is effective in preventing damage to the lungs upon high dose challenge. So they, they're kind of pretty uh, proud of that, that they protected the person and he may develop mild upper respiratory tract infection like things, some sore throat, but nothing to their lungs, which is, which is important. Similarly, over here, they're saying viral loads in bal, which is bronchoalveolar lavage, that is the fluid from inside the lungs. Viral loads in bal. So what we do is we throw a bronchoscope in the lungs and then we inject some fluid and we take that, that washed fluid out. So bal fluid and lung tissue of vaccinated animals were significantly reduced. So this is important. Viral load in the lungs was reduced. Okay, that's fine. Then what are they saying? Despite this, so suggesting that, let me go back here, suggesting that the vaccination prevents virus replication in the lower respiratory tract. That is their conclusion. Despite this marked difference in virus replication in the lungs, reduction in viral shedding from the nose was not observed. I think this is the line that people picked up and made headlines that Oxford's vaccine did not work and the monkeys showed the same amount of viral load in their nose compared to those that were not vaccinated. This is that line. So see, now that we have a study in front of us, we have data in front of us, we can actually look at that and analyze and think for ourselves instead of some news media telling us something. So fine, what they're saying is upper respiratory tract is not saved, but the lungs are. My curiosity is what happened to the upper respiratory tract? Why was the virus still able to replicate in the upper respiratory tract and not in the lower? But regardless, if this is what would happen, that the lungs will be protected, then that's fine. That at least saves people's lives. Now, then they said, they, they're trying to now explain it. They're saying, however, animals were challenged with a high dose of virus via multiple routes. So nasal route, uh, oral route, maybe eyes as well. I do not know if there are, are other routes as well, but anyways, so multiple routes and high dose of the virus, which likely does not reflect a realistic human exposure. So very good. So they're saying that, hey, our, our animals, the, the monkeys did develop upper respiratory tract infection. We get that, we admit that, but at the same time, we gave them very high dose and we gave them that dose from multiple routes. 
and this probably is not going to happen in a human being. So fine, we, we understand that. Whether a lower challenge dose would result in more efficient protection of the upper respiratory tract remains to be determined. They said, we don't know. Maybe if we had not challenged the monkeys with a higher dose, they would have been okay. So we don't know. Fine. That's okay. Importantly, we did not see any evidence. So this is very important. We did not see any evidence of immune enhanced disease in vaccinated animals. What they're saying is we did not see a cytokine storm. Now to balance this out here, we have generally seen that rhesus monkeys, macaques do not develop the cytokine st storms like humans do. So we don't know now that was it the, because it was a monkey who usually do not develop that overwhelming re immune response and that is why they didn't develop it or was it the vaccine itself? But their observation is that the, the monkeys did not develop cytokine. They're not calling it cytokine uh, storm. They're simply calling it immune enhanced disease. So, so that's a good term that they're using. But anyways, that is this overwhelming immune response. The immune response was not skewed towards a Th2 response in mice nor in non-human primates. So remember, we've been talking about T helper one side and T helper two side. So they said that the immune response was not skewed either. It stayed balanced as well. Fine. That is good. And now they're saying on May 13th, so we are in May 23, more than 1,000 volunteer studies starting. So so th this is what I wanted to put in front of us to say that here is how Oxford's actual data is. And I would consider two mistakes on my end as well. One, when I looked at Moderna, I looked at, of course, Moderna doesn't have data. So we had to look at the news. So whatever news said, I thought that was cool. But there is there are gaps in there. Similarly, for Oxford as well, the news was not as accurate or how should I say it? Maybe not as, as uh, accurate is the right word. <laughs> that was not as accurate. So I wanted to look into the study together with all of us to see that what did Oxford actually put out and what I'm looking. So here is the curiosity left in my head. What is going on with the upper respiratory tract? Why is it behaving differently from the lower respiratory tract? And if there is no uh, overwhelming immune response, is this because that was in animals and rhesus monkeys are known not to have overwhelming immune response or it is also going to be true for humans? So that is my worry. That is my curiosity. I have the same question that what were the amount of the antibodies produced? Were these uh, neutralizing antibodies or not? But instead of just telling us the amount, they had reinfected the, the monkeys and shown that nothing happened or they were protected. That is a good thing. So Sanju says, what are you trying to say? I don't know if you're asking me or you're asking someone else. It's not Moderna played hopes for money. I think so. Uh, call it like it is. News people are easily confused. Yeah, they confused us too. Anyways, it's not Moderna. Um, so then, any chances you should you could share the expert report you're reading with us, preferably a highlighted version, would live. So, I usually when I look at a report, I look at the uh, title and I go and uh, search for that title. So the title is. CHADOX1 and COV-19 vaccination prevents SARS-CoV-2 pneumonia with rhesus macaques. And you can also look it up by Dormalin study. And in here, what I had uh, highlighted is the discussion part of it. So of course they have the study methods and everything, We that's fine. But down here, they have discussion See, here they have discussion. So the very first paragraph of the discussion is something that I had highlighted. So hopefully that uh, answers your question, Richard. And let's continue our discussion. I have a couple of more things to cover, and then I'm going to be off for two days tomorrow and the after. And please do me a favor. Please like, subscribe, and share these. So one more news about Oxford, US has just paid them $1.2 billion. 
to provide 300,000, not 300,000, 300 million doses by October, October. So at least US is trying its best to say, come on, bring in the vaccines and we'll, we'll want to have them. So $1.2 billion given to uh, Astra Zanessa, that is a company that is working on it. <clears throat> so diversity says, I shall order one monkey bite followed by an injection of Lysol and a shot of <laughs> Artemisia. Fine. <laughs> we all have our choices. Okay. So now with this, now that we are talking about, um, I had not shared my screen. So with this, I would also like us to kind of look at these two. So there is a study, there is a uh, vaccine being made, developed by Sanofi and GlaxoSmithKline or Klein. So they both are making a, a vaccine as well. We know that we have talked about this before, Pfizer and BioNTech, German company, they are also making three or four products that they are getting ready for trials in humans. Uh, Johnson & Johnson is starting their trials in September or their vaccine, which will go for trial. So it is worth looking at them as well and just kind of keeping an eye. So in my opinion, Sanofi, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, then um, Oxford, then CanSino, Sinovac, and the um, Moderna. These are interesting ones to keep an eye on. Of course, there are 130 or 40 companies right now working on them. I cannot name them all. So uh, these are interesting. Now, the one more thing that I really, really want to talk about, and I have talked about this before as well, and I think I'm not yet satisfied that I've talked about it. And that is the CDC and CDC saying that the, and the, the surfaces may not be that big of a problem. Look at the CDC site. That day I was trying to go to that site and I was not able to find the link, but today I made sure that I have this. So they're saying now person to person. The virus is mainly from person to person. And there is a some, some reading between the lines here that is very important. Even with the person to person spread, they are saying it's only the droplets. They are saying it's only the droplets that are important. They are saying aerosol is not important. They don't even mention it, aerosol. Now, the studies that I know, and I would discredit those studies in a second, or I would kind of not discredit them, but I would say that why they may not be applicable, why CDC may be right, although I do not like it, what they're saying. The couple of studies that have done work on aerosol they developed aerosol by artificial measures. They had pumps that created the aerosols and that a human being may not be able to create aerosol with that kind of a force. So they're saying that the aerosol created was not that great. And because of that, those studies are not that great. But I still believe it very strongly that aerosols present in the closed environment, they linger on for a couple of hours and during that time, they would make people sick if they inhale them. And not only sick for, for the upper respiratory tract, the uh, particles are small enough to go deeper into our lungs and cause infection. But CDC does not have it. Maybe CDC is trying to think, maybe it is a study that is deficient and they, they don't believe in it. Or maybe they feel that the closed spaces should start functioning as well. So I don't know what is their point of view there, but they are mainly saying droplets. The other thing that they are going to say now, and since I talked about it last, now their page is further changed. Previously, when I was talking about it, they had the heading here was person to person spread is the main way. It was in the heading. And then here, other ways are not important, something like that. They restructured their this page once more. And now it says it may be possible that a person can get COVID-19 by touching a surface or object that has the virus on it. How bad is this statement? May be possible that if you touch a surface that has a virus. So let's say if somebody is infected, 
and they have their nasal secretion and they just touched it and they put that on a surface and you touch it and you touch your face, you know, lips or nose or eyes, don't you think you're going to get it? And they have simply started saying that it may be possible. And then, and then touching their own mouth, nose and pus. Look, then what are they saying? This is what was really interesting for me to observe. This is not thought to be the main way the virus spreads. Look at the disqualifying statement then. But we are still learning more about how this virus spreads. So on one hand, they're saying it would not really be the main way. But then they are covering their back by saying, well, we are still learning. God, CDC is still not learned. Here are the studies. Here. SARS-CoV-2, aerosol surface in lab. So this is also a Dormalin a all study. And I have that study open here as well. If anybody wants to, this is that study. Aerosol and surface stability of H cov 19 SARS-CoV-2. And in here, we found that viable virus could be detected in aerosols up to three hours post aerosolization up to four hours on copper, up to 24 hours on cardboard and so on. Both viruses, SARS-CoV-1 and 2, show relatively long viability on stainless steel and polypropylene compared to copper or cardboard. The median half-life estimate for HCOV-19 is around 13 hours on steel and around 16 hours on polypropylene. When we have such viability of virus on surfaces, why would we come out and say, that this is not thought to be the, who asked you to think, right? The, the CDC doesn't have to think, they have to look at the studies. They have to look at the data, the facts, and then come out and say, the studies say it may not be possible or the studies say it is possible. So I'm sorry, I am a little angry here because I feel this would put people at risk. People are going to go out, start touching things. They are going to start. Um, they are going to start coming close to each other, um, and so this can cause in further infections. So I have a very simple and a strong point here that fomites are bad, and we need to take care of it. We we should be we should do prevention. Nobody is asking people not to go out, but just be responsible. What's bad in saying that? as compared to just saying that, you know what? It just doesn't matter. And so let's go back to the studies. So this is, here is CDC statement. Here is WHO st statement. WHO, this is an old statement, 29 March. <clears throat> Respiratory infections can be transmitted through droplets, which are five to 10 micrometer. A few lectures ago, I called them nanometer, my apologies, micrometer. And then the aerosol, or airborne lesser than five micrometer. And here, WHO's point of view is this, which I agree with. This is a partial point of view, but still a correct one. What they're saying is that, look, there are some processes that produce aerosols. For example, the um, procedures, uh, medical procedures, here they have them, uh, endotracheal intubation, bronchoscopy, open suctions, administration of nebulization, treatment, manual ventilation before intubation, turning the patient to a prone position, disconnecting the patient in the ventilator, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, tricostomy, cardio, pulmonary resuscitation. These can produce aerosols. And they're saying that aerosol can also be a possibility, but it is not a usual possibility. I would suspect that it is a usual possibility as well. But anyways, according to WHO, it is not. According to CDC, it doesn't even, they don't even mention it. And then a recent publication in the New England Journal of Medicine has evaluated virus persistence of the COVID-19 virus. In this experimental study, aerosols were generated using a three-jet collision. So here they're saying that, hey, the study that they did, that study was done by artificial machines. So maybe a human being cannot do it that way. So maybe aerosol is not important. Fine. We can still look into that and say, okay, aerosols can be dangerous, and especially in healthcare profession, when you're working, aerosols can be generated and can be dangerous. I would have ex expected something like that over here. Anyways, it's not there. Then here is a study 
I would like you to read it if you can, Air, Aerosols and Surfaces, and they have done a very good job of explaining. And this study that I'm showing you, this is a study analysis of the other two studies that are on aerosol. And here is the very funny thing and scary thing. According to them, airborne aerosol transmission studies are inconsistent. So they are also discrediting, let's say, aerosol transmission. But look at this, something that CDC discredited, what they're talking about with regard to fomite transmission, that is the surfaces. Contamination hotspots merit extra attention when virus-laden droplets tend to deposit. Extra attention. An instance in point in the air exhaust outlets or vents where both studies showed positive swab samplings. Similarly, toilet rooms for patients should not be ignored. Explicitly, swab samplings from the toilet bowl and sink in patients' room were positive. Then they're saying shoes become positive. Then they're saying samples from the floor of pharmacy were positive. So with so much data available, if it is available to me, it is available to others as well. Why would we come out and say surfaces are not the main thing? Anyways, uh, I think that I made my point here. Uh, we are 50 minutes into it. I was going to talk about the test sensitivity and specificity as well. It's another 20, 30 minutes discussion. So let me stop here. We will talk about that in the coming days. Um, my apologies that I went on to a different topic than CoQ10, but I think that this was important. Um, so tell me any questions, any um, comments before we break. And Eid Mubarak to everyone. I will be off tomorrow and day after, and we'll meet again on Tuesday. So there is a, um, on CD's comment, we are missing the virulence of the virus, the number of minimal virus. So I actually have that answer. So uh, thank you, Barbara. Uh, so there is a co comment here from JD, which says that we are missing So let me show it to you. I was doing so. Check this out. Here in one of the studies, where is that study? I'm gonna look for. It's the five. The virus, I believe, five hundred uh, units of the virus are sufficient. But no, I I can't find it. But that's a very good question. So if a fomite has really tiny amount of virus, which means it has been cleaned, and this both CDC and WHO agrees that the public surfaces should be cleaned very often, and it is easy to disinfect them. Even the study I just showed you talks about it that, look at this. It says, even though the accumulation of the virus at hotspots may be troublesome, coronaviruses can be easily inactivated using common disinfectants containing adequate concentrations of biocidal agents such as ethanol, sodium hypochlorite, and hydrogen peroxide. So cleaning the surfaces again and again is a good idea. And yeah, that would reduce the viral load and that would be great. So Barbara, thank you very much for the e blessings and to you look into the, I would do that, Zigris, I would do that. In the monkey trial, did the control establish a lower respiratory infection? Yes, so the, at least from their study, they said the monkey's nasal swab or nasal load was the same as the control. But control, I believe, I believe, developed the lower respiratory tract infection and the, um, the one that were in the, the participant of the study, they did not. So that is what they're saying are, is a great thing. And I agree, if the lungs are protected, then that is great, fine. If I would take upper respiratory bother, botheration for some days compared to going on a ventilator or having a cytokine storm. How old were the monkeys? Don't, <laughs> they don't say human kids under 10 don't get pneumonia either. Yeah, so I probably didn't read it that um, you know thoroughly or Maybe they didn't say it. So Leslie, maybe this needs to be looked at. 
CDC downgrading because hospital fever cannot be helped, leading to nosocomial infections and older hospitals are. Mm. This is difficult to attack as HIV. Um, no, I don't think that the virus is that difficult to attack like HIV. It is, I think in a couple of months, we will be on top of this problem. We would either have the cocktails available to us to know how to stay prevented from this virus or in the early stages, how to defeat it or we'll have vaccinations going on as well. So I think we'll have something. I don't think we're going to, the whole world is trying to figure out a solution. Everybody is experimenting and everybody is trying to figure it out. So something is going to come up. I'm very, very um, happy with the latest uh, drugs that people are observing are useful. Closet picker, you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, truly and really appreciate it. Thank you for your service. You're very welcome. I am happy that we can do it. My only request is that please like, subscribe, and share. That is the only way I can continue to progress as well. Some hospitals are using UV light is great for disinfection. So Nada, you are very correct. And the UV light should be there. We should have simple, cheap solutions. That includes prevention. That includes vitamins. That includes cheaper drugs. That includes UV lights. That includes cleaning the surfaces. And that includes masks. These are simple things. We can open up the societies with these simple methods as well. Instead of you know, necessitating expensive treatments or ending up having people end up in on ventilators. Composition of vaccine contain contain conductors. What about the effect of chip in vaccine? Is present in the vaccine successive in this year? Polio has serious side effects. Yeah, so this has to be figured out that what is the right um, what is the right vaccine dose and what are the side effects of it? I like that in cocktail will be needed. Absolutely, Joe. Thank you for the organizing data we have. I was talking to my dad about Moderna today and don't have any references. So I, I have those links present as well. So please uh, take those links in the description. Um, replying to Adobe, very good. CD. So, all right. So let's uh, break for today. It's one hour. People don't watch my videos that they are very long. I hope that they are they're useful. And thank you for you all to be sticking with me. So I'll take two days off. So tomorrow and day after, and we'll meet again on Tuesday. We'll talk about CoQ10 on Tuesday. Then we'll talk about severity and sensitivity of the tests, and we'll continue doing the updates as well. So thank you very much. Have a happy weekend. Stay safe and healthy. Let's meet back again on Tuesday in health. So talk to you later. Bye-bye.